Go on and try a bite, baby. No. Why don't you try a bite, baby? Come on and try a bite, baby. Husband, no. Quote from a program at a Coolidge Memorial Service, 1933, cited in the Oxford Dictionary of Quotation, 1999. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, Press On, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. Hey folks, I'm Grimwit from NatchEvil.com and this is Natchian News. You may see from the video behind me that my wife and I went to the Rim Fair in Maryland for our anniversary. Good fun! Over the last two weeks, I've finished Shantae, if you haven't already seen, and have been working on improving my voice act. You'll have to forgive me, I've spent no time practicing the art before starting this show, and, alas, am too poor to purchase a good microphone. Slowly I'm improving, and I'd like to thank those who have been sending me tips and articles towards my efforts. One last thing before the show, if you have suggestions on how I can improve the program, or tips on voice acting, please leave them in the comments or send me an email at natchevil at gmail.com. I shrug off gripes, but I absorb tips. Our guest today is the helpful Axelmill, who spells his name Axelmill. With that said, let's dig into the show. Wilson Gate Episode 8 Asenath Special Guest Voice by Axenel with Evil Seedlet September 1921, Ravenloft Street So, a zombie walks into a bar and says <coughs> By bar I mean to say Dreamy's Drugstore and Soda Jerk at the corner of Ravenlove and Blue Crow. And, by zombie, I mean to say shambling monstrosity of the undead barely clothed in a tattered blue dress. The thing was wet with rain and slime, and its teeth, cracked and missing, grimaced behind its purple and nearly complete lips. Whoa! John Davis fumbled to unwrap the black cloth around his rifle while he fell off his stool. Shoulder to the floor... John cocked the repeater and took aim. Ah! screamed Taxi Smith cheerfully behind the counter, casually filling a glass with some gray and putrid-smelling liquid. It is good friend Gerald! What? John yelled, holding his aim while the decaying mess sludged onto a stool and knocked a fleshless hand against the bar. Taxi scratched under his right face fin before sliding the muck-filled soda glass in front of the zombie. Thanks, Taxi. You are made of welcome, friend Gerald. Smith's serrated grin shined with slime. Now, friend Jonathan, you were speaking of wolfing? No, stop. Someone explain. John picked himself off the floor and started to rewrap the black cotton shroud around his rifle. Has anyone else got a problem with the living dead coming in here and ordering a drink? He looked around the room. Jeb? Jebediah Termite, a cow-skull-faced man in a blue jacket, shrugged and took a slurp from his straw. David? David Mitch Marshall had moved to the furthest stool from the undead wretch and seemed as if he were trying to melt the counter with his eyesight alone. I d d don't know what you're talking about, sir. He swallowed hard and tightened his eyelids, then denied with all the might he could whimper up. Th th there's nothing dead in the building. The problem is what, human Jonathan? Is Gerald. He's town gravedigger, in graveyard, with graves he digs. Yes. 
Gerald? John pointed an accusing finger at the zombie. But that thing was a woman. Cursed. Groaned the wet lump of filth and bone. What is not so bad? Gerald put his half-destroyed lips to the soda straw, clenched broken teeth around the tip to suck up the horrid gray drink. Its efforts were in vain. But John sat down and held his head. How did this happen? August, 1921. San Faustina Street. Perhaps it was the dark circles under his eyes that allowed the gravedigger to see so well at night. Only after sunset did he allow his shovel to dip into the dirt next to the church of St. Faustina. That night, the moon hung impossibly in the north sky, wearing a shawl of mist and watching with approval. Dip went the shovel. Crunch went the dirt. Thud went the rotten wood of the coffin under Gerald's boots. Gerald Wiseman, what are you doing? Melody Redmark had one hand on her lantern and the other on her hip. The blood smeared on her face bandage formed a frown. As you can clearly see, that grave's been taken. She pointed at the gravestone. The name, Asenath, and a date, was scrawled in simple letters into the granite. Ooh, you had better not be doing what I think you're doing. Why, I blush at the thought. I would never. Ha, <laughs> too late for never, Gerald Wiseman. If I see you doing that awful... She fumed at the thought. Awful bad, bad thing again. I'll... I'll... The young girl stomped her foot, sending a small slide of dust to join Gerald in the semi-deep grave. Holy smokes, I can't be held responsible for what I'll do. While Melody dedicated her lung power to lecturing the gravedigger, he busied himself with brushing earth off his treasure chest of death. The wood was old and rotten, but not forgiving under Gerald's weight. Nailed into the top of the casket was a brass plaque, which Gerald quickly wiped clean using his sleeve and some spit. There were no words, only a strange symbol inside a perfect circle. It looked like a single eye with lines crowning it like horns above, with more lines stretching downwards as a cross. Gerald stood fixated on the sign in brass, which reflected moonlight only unable to pull his focus from the coffin's decoration for perhaps minutes. Are you even listening to me? Melody stomped again, sending more pebbles and earth into the hole. Peanuts! She swore. You look at me this instant, Gerald Wiseman. When she got no response, Melody humped loudly, turned on her heel, and marched back into the church, leaving Gerald with his prize. He planted both feet into the soft soil walls to make room, then tugged at the lid with a pry bar. He could not know it at the time, but as the nails pulled loose from the dead wood, so too tore paper wards and enchanted ropes weakened by rot. An evil breath hissed from the rift of the funerary box. The miasma snuck out of the grave and encircled an innocent sleeping squirrel who fell dead from the tree and crumbled like ash on impact. Gerald was unaware of all of this. The lid opened for him, opened and revealed the ruined body of Asenath, flesh gray-green and withered, barely gripping her filthy bones. Gerald didn't hear Melody, the hiss of the grave, or the death of the squirrel. He couldn't hear anything over his beating chambers, rhythmically pounding in his ears, moving a traffic of blood to all his extremities, all of them, even the savage ones you're not supposed to talk about at the dinner table. Long ago, he had found a loophole in one of the town's sins, and Melody had caught him. He felt the need to exploit that hole on this cursed night. The obscene grave digger leaned over and intimately onto the corpse, but before his lips could grasp the decomposing same of Asenath, he felt a cruel, unnatural grip on his temples. Though destroyed in theory with neglect, Asenath's skeletal fingers held a dread grasp on the gravedigger's head. Unable to move, he screamed, joined soon by the dead thing underneath him. Together they made a duet of shrieks, 
decorating the empty sky like lightning, a noise that crossed between the cry of a wounded animal and a set of bagpipes. The moon seemed to appraise the song and found it good. After two minutes of music, the back door of St. Faustina slammed open. Melody Redmark burst outside, dragging a holy claymore behind her and yelling, What the heck is going on out here? Gerald's body stood up and peered at Melody over the lip of the grave. Nothing, he smirked calmly, looking at her through newly colored eyes. I'm filling in the hole now, ma'am. September 1921, again. Ravenlove Street. <sighs> One week to dig out. Gerald said, sitting on a stool inside Asenath's rotten body. It took another gulp from its glass and let the gray ooze slide out of its bloated neck and from under its ribs. David Mitch Marshall gagged and ran to the men's room. Jebediah Termite, on the other hand, leaned over to steal another straw and asked, Did you ever find your body, Mr. Weissman? No. Think it's still digging. On cue, the door jingled open, letting rain spatter inside. Standing silhouetted at the entrance was the body of Gerald Weissman, a soaked and painful expression on his stolen face. Thank the Dark Lords I found you, it said. Oh, there it is, Jebediah smoothed before starting on his second soda. Gerald's body half marched and half ran to Asenath's side, who was still turning in surprise. Corpses don't move very fast, you understand. Close behind and rushing in from the rain was an angry yellow blur under an equally yellow umbrella. Melody harshly shut the door and yelled, You're not getting away that easily, Mr. Wiseman. I won't allow that kind of thing in my graveyard. Oh no! Gerald's body cringed. She still follows. The body grabbed Asenath's skull by the temples and demanded, Take it back! Take it back! The two screamed in duet again, an encore that surged a new rush of blood filling everyone's arteries, even the corpses. There was a wake of reality that snapped back into place, filling an unseen void with a loud pop and blowing everyone except Asenath and Gerald off their respective seats and feet. Taxi stuck his green head above the counter to look around. What happened? he asked. Free! The corpse said as it shambled and danced past Melody, who was knocked on her backside. Then it ran out the front door of the building. Free! What? Melody tried to shake the webs off her brain. What was that about? A pair of piercing bright eyes peeked into the window with curiosity. They belonged to a wet little girl dressed only in wolf pelts and gripping a hatchet. Taxi pointed at her. Friend Jonathan, is that not what you were speaking of? The wolf! Jonathan scrambled up his stool, quickly grabbing his rifle and flinging the cloth off of it. Then he dashed outside, chasing the girl into the rain. Those inside Dreamy's drugstore and soda jerk heard at least five gunshots that night. Aww, said Gerald, lamenting. I'm gonna miss that sexy corpse. If you like Whirlson Gate or Natchian News, hit like, share, subscribe, or whatever. There's also a link in the doodly-doo if you're kind enough to donate to the cause. Every dollar will surprise me like a green spider suddenly falling on my face while I play Amnesia. Super thanks goes to Evil Seedlet for her voice work. If you like Evil Seedlet's voice, she's got a YouTube channel. Music for this show was unknowingly provided by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Both Seedlet and McLeod's links are found in the description below. The noun for this episode was Taxi Store. Leave a comment suggesting your favorite person, place, or thing from this episode, and I will include it in the next, forming a chain of nouns. Have nothing but fun, you dudes. Have nothing but fun.
ninja reflexes. <laughs> Thank you. Chicken reflexes. <laughs> Colonel Sanders reflex. <laughs> Whoa! Whoa! Swish! Whoa! 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 Don't ask him where his other ones are. <laughs> <laughs>